Okay, welcome to the last session of this engineering track that is on combustion that is emerging paradigm. So in this session we have two moderators, uh, Professor Sudarshan Kumar and Professor Bhupendra Khandelwal. Professor Sudarshan Kumar has received his master's and PhD degrees from the, Aero, uh, from the Aerospace Department, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India. He worked as a postdoctoral researcher in Energy uh, Biodynamics Laboratory, uh, Tokyo University, Japan from 2004 to 6. Uh, since uh, 2006, he has been working as a faculty member in the Department of Aerospace Engineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. His areas of research includes measurement, uh, uh, microcombustion, patterns formation of flames, laminar burning velocity measurement, flame dynamics in micro channel, numerical modeling of flames, uh, propagation mild flameless combustion with gaseous liquid fuels, biofuels, spray combustion and emission reduction from the combustion system. The second moderator of this uh, session, Professor Bhupin Khandelwal, is working as an aerospace uh, uh, associate professor for fuels and combustion at the University of Alabama. He is working on combustion emissions and performance of alternative fuels to be used in gas turbine engines and other combustion sources. Prior to this position, Dr. Khandelwal held the position of assistant professor at the University of Sheffield Low Carbon Combustion Center, LCCC. He was leading combustion and emission research uh, area of LCCC. With this introduction, I would like to hand over the session to the moderator, Professor Sudarshan Kumar. I thank the uh, Professor Kalendra for giving nice introduction. Uh, let me welcome my panel members. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel today to discuss the topic combustion, what are the emerging paradigms. Uh, we have uh, uh, five members, uh, three of uh, them are online, and another two are there with us physically and we are going to discuss uh, various aspects what are emerging in the field of the combustion. Uh, we have Professor Anai Kim from uh, Kayas Korea. He is going to talk on uh, high pressure oxy OH2 combustion. Professor Kim has done his PhD from Kayas. He has worked in uh, Tohoku University. He has worked in Princeton University and has a very wide experience in the field of combustion. Uh, then we will have Professor Arvind Rao from Delft University. He is uh, alumni of IIT Bombay. He worked in Israel and then he moved to Delft University as a faculty member. He will be talking on flameless combustion for ultra low emissions in gas turbine engines. Then we have Professor Sean Chen from uh, University of New South Wales, Australia. He is going to work on hydrogen addition to diesel engines for dual fuel applications in IC engines. Then we have Professor Anirudh Amekar who is going to talk about the next generation energy applications using carbon free fuels that is metal fuels. Uh, we have Professor Ajit Dupe from IIT Rurki. He is going to talk on uh, ammonia combustion and high fidelity numerical simulations. So these are some of the interesting topics which we have and we are going to cover in next one hour. Uh, so I request as my distinguished speakers to start the presentation. Uh, first to start with uh, Professor Anai Kim, then uh, Professor Arvind Rao, then Professor Sean Chan, followed by Professor Ambekar and Dupe. So I request Professor Anai Kim to start. Welcome Professor Kim, nice to see you online. Sir, please unmute yourself. So can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Professor Strachan Kumar, for your nice introduction. So today I will talk about the hydrogen oxy combustion at high pressure. So I need to share my material or will you show the material from your side?
Oh, professor. Oh, professor. professor Kim, your internet connection is unstable. You can switch off your video. Professor Kim, can you hear our voice? Network. Professor Kim? Yes. Can anyone else confirm? Sanjay? Yeah, Professor Kim, please uh, switch off your camera. Actually, you are facing internet connection issue. Hello, Professor Kim. Yes. Yes. So uh, now I we are uh, now you can start your presentation. Okay. So today I will talk. Can you see this material? May I start? Okay, so today I will talk about uh, hydrogen oxygen combustion at high pressures. So you requested uh, emerging technology in the combustion field. Actually, I'm doing this uh, study that is uh, at the essential state. So recently, I conducted another project, for example, development and demonstration of direct fired supercritical CO2 power cycle. We conducted this study with the Saudi Aramco during last four years. Simply, it requires a very high pressure and high temperature combustion. For example, the burner inlet temperature was about 1000 Kelvin and its pressure is about 300 bar. So for that, we need new technologies. So please turn to the next page. Yeah. The merit of high pressure combustion technology is uh, the larger power density. So for example, in this figure, you can see an ordinary power plant in Korea. So its uh, height is, uh, oil height is 70 meter and size is seven meter by seven meter, 21 meter. But if we decrease this uh, uh, boiler at high pressure, theoretically we can reduce uh, its volume to one 300. So the scale will become 10 meter, three meter by three meter. Then we can put nine buildings within the same 21 meter, 21 meter area. 
so it will be very good for power density. In addition, to make to achieve that temperature, we needed to use the oxy combustion. Basically, inlet temperature is very high, and temperature increase is not so high. So we will use 37 moles of CO CO2 for each met one mole of methane. It requires two moles of oxygen and additional six moles of co-flowing CO2. Then we can achieve one 1150 degrees Celsius at the outlet of the burner. In that case, we can produce one moles of CO2 and two moles of H2O. By separating this CO2 and H2O, we can operate this system continuously. It is the basic concept of the supercritical CO2 combustion. So please, next page. But recently, the need of supercritical CO2 combustion decreased because recently Korean government wants to change all power plants to hydrogen gas turbine. 20 years ago, in the combustion study, there was two ways. One is studying combustion dynamics and the other was studying about the combustion chemistry. So many students and researchers went to the way of combustion chemistry because one reason is uh, it is easy to write the papers because uh, the fuel composition is very complex. But recently, all government wants to use just the hydrogen-based fuels. In that case, if we uh, electrolyze the water, then hydrogen and oxygen can be produced. Then from this hydrogen, we can produce uh, ammonia or some part of night the, the natural gas will be used. In that case, CO2 capture and storage will be necessary. The difference of this uh, methane, hydrogen, and ammonia from the other fuel is that they are very light compared to the other fuels or air. So Lewis number or Schumann number of these fuels are less than unity. In that case, combustion instability will be enhanced and it is uh, strongly interact with the scale effect. So to design a new burner, we need to understand the scale effect on the flame dynamics. So next page. So basically in the combustion theory, flame structure consists is interacting with various physical length scales. For example, reaction layer or diffusion layer or thermal layer or quenching distance and momentum, momentum scales and a cellular scale is interacting with the, the, the reaction characteristics through the Markstein scale. And this uh, laminar flame theory is uh, also interacting with the heat transfer, flow field, and reaction mechanism. So we need to understand this interaction to design new burner at high pressure. So next page. So today I will introduce the three burners that can be used to investigate the length scale effect. The first one is the, the ASDT. It is the annular stepwise diversion tube. So flame in the annular channel will be stabilized where the flow velocity is matched to the propagation velocity. Using this burner, we can draw various uh, results. Next phase, for example, in the case of hydrogen, we can easily evaluate the flame propagation velocity on the right hand side and so the quenching distance at the same time. So we can use this burner to investigate hydrogen characteristics even at high pressure. So next phase. The second burner, what I am using recently is the NGDB, narrow gap disk burner. Oh, so movie doesn't work. At the middle, there was a, in the previous slide, there was a movie of the flame propagation, but you cannot see. Just wait. Then, so this burner can change the distance between the plate and we can see the propagation, unsteady propagation by changing the distance precisely 
we can distinguish the different instabilities. Okay, next page. We can also measure the quenching distance. This figure shows the, the effect of hydrogen addition to the methane on the left-hand side and the propane on the right-hand side. In the case of methane, when you added the hydrogen, Lewis number doesn't change. So when in the lean side, small Lewis number become more smaller and larger Lewis number become larger. So the trend doesn't change. So you can see that just the catching distance shift to the downside with the keeping the same shape, but on the right hand side, the propane lean side Lewis number is larger than one but if you add the hydrogen, its Lewis number becomes much smaller than unity. In rich side, the smaller Lewis number of propane becomes much larger with the addition of hydrogen. Then you can see that there is a turning point and the shape changes differently. So through this study, we can understand the Lewis number effect on the canteen. So next page. So the, the unsteady propagation can be summarized in, uh, in this figure. Please click once, then you can see the box, the red box. Within this red box, it shows the, the flame propagation of hydrogen additions. So in a single circular figure, you can see the D cap, it is normalized distance. The disk gap was normalized with the catching distance. So D cap increase in the clockwise direction from 1.3, 1.5, 1.8, 2.5. 1 in that case, the flame propagation characteristics change. In the case of hydrogen addition, the cellular structure become enhanced and the complex phenomena could be captured. I cannot explain all of them in this presentation, but anyway, using this burner, we can understand hydrogen effects on the unsteady flame propagation. So the third burner is the high pressure chamber. Using the high pressure experiment, we can control the, the relative length scale of the flame. So if you increase the pressure, then flame thickness will become thinner and the Reynolds number will increase even, the, even with a very small burner. So using this burner, as you can see, this burner doesn't have any window to outside. All camera and the measuring devices were put into the, the chamber. So we can increase this pressure up to 100 bar. But the supply system now, it can support just up to 7 bar. So we are doing experiment under 7 bar. And we expect that its relation will be maintained up to the 49 or 50 bar. So we can estimate what will happen in higher pressure. So next page, using this burner, recently we studied the, the laminar lifted flame again. So you may know the stabilization mechanism of the edge flame, but this laminar flame is formed within very limited triangle of the stabilization limit. So this uh, laminar lifted flame can be used to investigate the flame structures, but you cannot use this structure in a practical burner design. So we need to use the turbulent lifted flame. So next page, you can change it. The, you can control the lifted height, but as you can see, the lift of height of turbulent flame is the changing depending on the flow velocity or pure concentration or characteristics. So non-linearly change. Recently, we analyzed the reason of this non-linear variation. So next phase is the most important. I will briefly explain the overall flame stabilization mechanism from the laminar flame to the turbulent lifted flame. In the case of A, the flame is stabilized above the mixing core, so developing core, so similarity solution is satisfied. In that case, we can stabilize laminar lifted flame, like the figure on the left-hand side. So Professor Sokho Chong from Seoul National University studied 
very much about it, but this flame cannot be used for practical burner. So if we increase the, the flow rate, like the case B, then the mixing core increase. Then flame is stabilized within the mixing layer. And if we increase the flow rate further, then in the case of C, the flame moved to downstream, but it is interacting with the, the external turbulent and flame base becomes turbulent. If we increase the flow rate, then the ejected flow from the tube become turbulent and turbulent vortex is generated from the tube and it extinguishes locally. Then flame, if you increase the flow rate like the E, case E, then strong turbulent region will increase the so lifted flame height will increase again. In that case, if you increase the, the tube diameter, like the case F, then Reynolds number is the same, but turbulent intensity decrease. So lift of height will decrease. So if you understand that this mechanism, then you can design your the flame hole of the burner, even at high pressure. So next. So recently we used increased the hydrogen, the concentration. In that case, you can see a very different stabilization, the curve, lift off height trend you can see within the dash the circle. Then recently we found it is concerned with the extinction, the stretch rate. So we are writing paper about this nowadays. Okay. It is the it will be last slide. So next page. So if we increase the hydrogen intensity, we can observe three flame stabilization conditions. So inner attached IA, outer attached OA, so inner lifted condition IL. So IL condition is the best condition for design of a high pressure hydrogen burner. So I recommend that design of the burner should be located in the IL region on the right-hand side figure. So please, this is the summary. So we needed to study of hydrogen oxygen combustion at high pressure. So we needed to understand the length scale effect of design, it's important. And we can use ASDT, NGDB and high pressure burners. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kim. Yeah. We will, uh, yeah, so we will go with the next presentation, yeah, Professor Arvind Rao. Yeah. 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 Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, thanks, uh, Professor Sudarshan, for giving me this opportunity to uh, share my views with you. Um, well, um, I have a different version of presentation here. I was wondering if I could share that because it has some videos. Um, and if it's not possible, then we can go ahead with uh, the version that you have there. Uh, shall I try to share my screen? Is that possible? Okay. Anyway, um, so let's uh, go ahead. Um, well, I, I work in the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering, um, as Dr. Sudarshan mentioned. Um, and uh, what, what we have seen is that, uh, you know, I mean, of course, um, energy transition is taking place on, on, on a larger scale in a large number of uh, places, um, especially, of course, in the energy sector, but not only in the energy sector, but also in other sectors. And um, what you see is that uh, even aviation is uh, going through an energy transition. Uh, and and uh, well, we are looking at uh, the climate impact of aviation uh, because uh, because of its CO2 emission, but also non-CO2 emission. And what you see on this chart, uh, and this is from a paper that we published recently, um, along with my colleagues in DLR, where we looked at um, the aviation system and looked at the climate impact on a larger scale. 
And what you see is um, the radiative forcing that is caused because of aviation. And how is that going to change in the years to come? So um, I cannot use my pointer here, but what you, you would see is uh, in the, the bars in the middle are actually representing the radiative forcing because of aviation. That would be in the year 2050. And the bars on the right-hand side of the chart is what you would be able to see um, are the radiative forcing because of aviation if we do not do anything in the year 2100. And what you would also see are these different uh, colors on these bars. And these different, these different colors refers to different mechanisms in which uh, the radiative forcing is going to happen. And um, so we all know that CO2 is quite uh, bad for the environment from a global warming point of view, yeah, because uh, it's a radiative active gas, CO2. Uh, but um, when you look, um, for, especially for aviation, um, because the cruising altitude is approximately around 10 or 11 kilometers, there um, even other species become radiatively active, and that is uh, one of them is NOx, right? So we're talking about NO, NO2, or N2O, and these species are also uh, radiatively active, and, uh, and there are a couple of mechanisms why NOx becomes important. And one is that it creates ozone, um, which is also a radiatively active gas. And, uh, but it also has a cooling effect and because that is because it destroys methane. Yeah. So, um, and then water vapor also becomes uh, an issue because it can form contrails. Yes. Um, so, so there are different mechanisms because of which, uh, let's say emissions affect the global warming. And in this context, what I wanted to say, uh, basically from a combustion point of view, is that uh, not only CO2 is important, but also NOx is also very important when it comes to global warming and climate impact of aviation. Uh, next slide, please. So um, you might have heard uh, in the well in the, in the news or in the popular media and so on and so forth that you know there are electric flights and so on uh, and. Uh, electric aircraft uh, well um, what you see on this graph is um, on the on the x-axis you see passenger kilometers yeah so there are there are different transport modes okay so on the x-axis you see passenger kilometers so this this is like the number of passengers and the distance that can be achieved by by a given vehicle and on the y-axis what you see is the amount of energy that is carried on board yeah um, so when we talk about, uh, you know, e-bikes, e-scooters and so on and so forth, you know, the amount of energy that is carried on board is few megajoules. Yeah? And, and that is uh, that you can do very easily with batteries. When you talk about uh, cars uh, and let's say, for example, Tesla, then uh, you carry around a couple of hundred megajoules. Yeah? And, um, and, that, and that is possible. But after that, uh, the battery, the weight, the power to weight ratio of batteries are low. And that's why the weight of the vehicle increases quite a lot. So for example, when you, when you talk about a bus, uh, which has to carry approximately around 10, you know, around 10 gigajoules of energy, that is very difficult to be done by uh, batteries. And that's why we require liquid fuels, uh, especially hydrocarbons, yeah? uh, whether it is coming from fossil fuel or from any synthetic source or from something else. <clears throat> or hydrogen, it does not matter. But when you look at an energy requirement of something like an A320 on long range uh, mission, then what you would see is that the energy requirement is approximately around a terajoule. Yeah? And for a uh, bigger aircraft like A380, that is approximately 10 times of that. Yeah? So it just uh, tells you the, um, the, the order of magnitude that is uh, required in terms of the energy that has to be carried on board. And um, <clears throat> so depending on the, energy requirement, we need to look at different energy sources. So for uh, for for few megajoules or a couple of hundred megajoules, we can use batteries. But after that, we have to look at hydrogen. We have to look at synthetic kerosene. We have to look at other biofuel and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So, um, well, so I, I talked to, to you about two main things. So one is that NOx uh, is important and the reduction of NOx is important. And the second thing is that we have to also look at fuel flexibility. And with these two things in mind, we were looking at different engine architectures and different aircraft configurations uh, as to how we can use it. <clears throat> and one of the things uh, that we did in this European project called us ahead <clears throat> is where we looked at um, the, uh, the possibility of using 
um, an aero engine with two uh, combustion chambers. This is this configuration is what is called as an inter turbine burner. So on the on this figure, uh, you see a schematic of a gas turbine um, where there are two combustion chambers. So the first combustion chamber is located between um, the high pressure compressor and the high pressure turbine, and that is the main combustor. Uh, and the second combustion chamber is located between the high pressure turbine and the low pressure turbine, and that is what we call as an interstage turbine burner. Yeah. And this second st stage burner or the interstage turbine burner is uh, what was supposed to be run on flameless combustion. Yeah. And why do we do this? Because uh, there are several advantage of this. Uh, first of all, is that when you use such a configuration, yeah, uh, the specific thrust of the engine is high, and it can reduce NOx quite a lot. Um, so as compared to current day engines, we can reduce NOx by more than 90. So, so that is quite a big uh, achievement, and uh, it so, so and having two uh, combustion chambers also gives flexibility in terms of the fuels that we could use. So, for example, in this project, what we were aiming at is the main combustion on hydrogen and the second combustion on uh, on biofuels. Yeah. So, uh, so such a configuration is is quite good from a, a NOx point of view. And uh, one of the things that we also found is that uh, the NOx that is created in the first combustion chamber is actually is oxidized or reburned in the second combustion chamber. So this was another mechanism, the reburning mechanism that we could use in order to reduce NOx emissions in the second combustion chamber. Yeah. So so um, can, uh, can you please click, please? So then that is a that's a picture of yeah. So here you. Uh, Sorry, could you go back? Yes. So here you see the engine that we designed along with uh, Pat and Whitney. And this is, uh, I cannot show you more details, but uh, here you can see a picture where um, the first combustion chamber is, is hydrogen and the second combustion chamber, which is kind of a toroid. Um, and uh, so, so that is the flameless combustion chamber. Yeah. And uh, the whole idea of flameless combustion chamber revolves around the fact that we have to recirculate the combustion products back uh, actually, Professor Sudarshan uh, is 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 a better expert than me in flameless combustion, so he could tell you more on flameless. Uh, so what we do is uh, part of the combustion products have to be recirculated back, and by doing so, we increase the temperature of the inlet reactants. Next slide, please. Yeah, yeah. So here, here uh, you can see the same thing uh, on a, on a picture. So on the x-axis, what you see is uh, oxygen concentration. Uh, or dilutants, uh, uh, and they are inversely proportional to each other. And on the y-axis, you see the temperature of the reactants. So flameless combustion is a combustion regime that takes place in low oxygen concentration and high te inlet temperatures. Yeah? And this we can achieve by recirculating part of the combustion products back into the combustion zone. And by doing so, what happens is that the NOx emission is reduced quite a lot. And that is there are several mechanisms to this. First of all is that the, the, the thermal gradients are less. Secondly, uh, there's a co the oxygen concentration is less, so NOx formation is reduced. Um, and uh, what we also found is that the chemical mechanisms that are uh, active in flameless combustion are quite different as compared to normal combustion, because when we talk about normal gas turbine combustion, the thermal NOx mechanism is the dominant mechanism. And that, has, that is not the case. Uh, so, so flameless combustion as such has several, some advantages. And what you see here, uh, is is the schematic representation of that, and uh, so the uh, the engine that I showed you earlier tries to use use this um, flameless combustion regime, which is depicted on the top left uh, corner of this chart. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. So here, what we found is that when we looked at, uh, so we we did some tests. Um, um, unfortunately, I forgot to put the videos of the test on this slide. Yeah. Um, we did some tests on flameless combustion, and uh, um, and we uh, indeed uh, the the NOx emission was quite less. Um, and uh, but the diagnostic facility that we had at that time was pretty limited, so we did carry out uh, chemical reacting uh, simulations uh, CRM uh, with with full detailed chemistry to see what are the possible um, uh, possible mechanisms that could take place. In, in, in such a combustion chamber. And what we found is that, uh, is that uh, let's say the thermal NOx mechanism is not the dominant form of NOx mechanism that is present when you recirculate combustion products. Yeah, and uh, and, and in, in this case, uh, the prompt um, and the mechanism is, 
uh, is, is uh, one of the most prominent ones, apart from the N2O and, uh, and other NOx forming mechanisms. And what you can also see is that reburning is present also. And, and this is one of the reasons why non, the NOx emission uh, is quite non-linear uh, when it comes to uh, equivalence ratios. Yeah. Um, so so um, coming back uh, to, um, to, to kind of summarize uh, this, this part, a uh, few things, uh, take, take home message, let's say, is that NOx emission uh, is important. Um, and, uh, and we have to look at NOx uh, and fuel flexibility is also very important. Um, and when we look at these two things, then uh, flameless combustion is one of the techniques where we can exploit these two um, combinations. And uh, this was demonstrated in the project that I mentioned. And we are looking at it uh, further with some more experiments, detailed experiments in my lab at the moment. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. And with this, I would like to thank um, the uh, that the funding agencies that have funded this research, and uh, they are mainly the Framework Program Seven, the Clean Sky Two, uh, the Horizon Twenty Twenty European uh, Program, and uh, the Dutch uh, Holland High Tech uh, programs. Thanks a lot. If you have any questions, I think uh, Professor Sudarshan will moderate that later. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Arvind Rao. Uh, we are going with the next presentation. We will have three questions at the end. So I request uh, Professor Sean Chen to start his presentation. We will uh, uh, share this nice talk here. Thank you. Yeah, Professor All right, can you hear me? Right, a very good afternoon to all of you. It, um, it's obviously a great pleasure for me to be uh, here today just to share with you some of the findings from my research group. So this project is funded by the Australian Renewable Energy Agency that's aimed at enabling the efficient, affordable, and robust use of renewable energy in the transportation and power generation. Uh, next slide, please. So hydrogen is long recognized as a potential uh, future fuel in the powertrain because of its carbon-free emission, carbon-free content, and also its renewable potential. Uh, although at the moment, hydrogen is primarily produced from carbon-based sources such as natural gas, uh, hydrogen can also be produced using water uh, electrolysis technologies, which are subsequently powered using wind uh, power or, or uh, solar energy, making it uh, renewable-based. Uh, there are many different ways to incorporate hydrogen into powertrains and the one being the most uh, popular one would be the fuel cell whereby the hydrogen is converted into electricity energy there are already some market ready models from various companies such as toyota honda and hyundai and if you look at the literature there are more than 6500 units so as of june 2018 and the reported tank to well efficiencies of these models are typically very uh, quite reasonable ranging from 31 percent to 36 percent However, there are still ongoing uh, researchers looking into the incorporation of hydrogen into powertrain through the means of intern, uh, inter, sorry, internal combustion engine. And the reason behind this is because of the uh, potential advantages that it can allow. For example, the conversion from a conventional vehicle in, uh, into one that can use hydrogen would be relatively more straightforward. Uh, in general, uh, the internal combustion engine has a higher tolerance towards fuel impurities, Whereas if you were to use a few cells, you can potentially experience poisoning in the presence of impurities. Uh, there's less rare earth minerals consumption when it comes to ICE. And uh, depending on how you design the engine, you could potentially switch between different fuel modes uh, depending on the fuel supply uh, status. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if you look into the literature, there are many different approaches that look into the use of incorporation of hydrogen into the powertrain through uh, internal combustion engine. And most of these studies look into the use of port field injection technologies just because of the ease of implementation. However, there are a couple of unique properties that are associated with hydrogen uh, when compared to other uh, conventional uh, gaseous or liquid fuel uh, that makes it really hard to implement with the use of uh, port field injection. So if you look at the table below, it's just a comparison of hydrogen with the other properties of other commonly used uh, uh, gaseous or liquefied fuel in the transportation sector. And you will notice that the volumetric energy content of hydrogen is significantly lesser than the two other fuels, 
what this implies is that you need to produce, provide a lot of hydrogen in order for you to achieve the same power output as that of the other few. And when, if this were to happen, uh, ultimately this will lead to a reduction in the air intake process during fuel injection, leading to volumetric loss. In addition to that, the presence of more gases fuel, typically introduced during the intake stroke, will mean that more and more compression work will need to be done in order to compress the fuel, leading to compression loss. So if you look at the table again, the hydrogen has a high auto emission temperature, which means that you can potentially use a high compression ratio just to make the engine a lot more efficient. But at the same time, the hydrogen has a very low minimum ignition energy. Uh, what this basically implies is that in the presence of any hot spots or uh, residues from the previous combustion cycle, this could potentially lead to the uh, occurrence of pre-ignition leading to a loss of mechanical phasing as well as uh, leading to mechanical failure. Uh, the hydrogen also has a very short quenching distance as high flame speed. So there's a risk of backfiring back into the intake manifold. And in addition to that, the short quenching distance means that the combustion of hydrogen can actually happen really close to the wall, leading to enhanced heat loss. So these are the issues that are associated with the use of pot fuel injection. Uh, next slide, please. So what we propose here is the use of direct injection technology, which has uh, the potential to overcome many of the limitations that we have previously identified. So if you were to inject the hydrogen directly into the cylinder during the compression stroke after the intake, uh, intake valves have been closed, you can potentially avoid the volumetric loss issue that we previously mentioned. Now, in addition to that, the retardation of the injection timing which means that you'll be able to minimize backfiring as well as redu a reduction in the compression loss. Now, one thing to note is that um, in addition to that, uh, depending on how you uh, orientate your injector and uh, manipulate the injection timing, you could potentially result in a more stratification, more stratified fuel mixture closer to the center of the engine cylinder rather than the side, therefore reducing the heat loss. However, as we've noted previously, hydrogen has a high auto ignition what it basically implies that even though you can potentially use a compression ratio just to increase the efficiency of the engine, it also implies that you need an extremely high compression ratio just to get it to auto-ignite if that's the mode that you intend to operate it at. So previous studies have shown that an auto-ignition of hydrogen would require a compression ratio ranging from approximately 24 to about 42, which is about two times that of the modern engine. So what this implies is that if you really want to run hydrogen in a compression ignition engine, it's very possible that we require an external ignition source, either coming from a spark plug, a glow plug, or even a pilot fuel diesel, which is what we're going to look into. There are a couple of challenges associated with the use of direct injection. Uh, first and foremost, there's no commercially available high pressure injection system. And this itself plays a significant uh, uh, limitation on the number of uh, R&D that can go into this area. So in addition to that, the low energy and the density means that in, in addition to supplying a lot of um, hydrogen uh, to enable the same power output, you'll probably also need to store the hydrogen on board if hydrogen were to be used as a transportation fuel, and this is not an, is an easy issue to um, overcome. Uh, hydrogen has an embrittlement issue, so it can interact with materials, causing it to, to uh, un undergo undesirable changes. So this can lead to some storage and supply safety issue. And there's also a lack of fundamental understanding of the high pressure hydrogen jet, uh, which is uh, something that not a lot of people have looked into. Uh, it's impossible for us to tackle all these questions, and the current project is only looking to address the final point. Uh, next slide, please. So at UNSW, we are performing a series of experiments in the constant volume combustion chamber and engine just to look at the various uh, practical and also fundamental issues associated with hydrogen diesel direct uh, injection combustion. And in addition to that, we are also more, uh, performing a, a series of modeling just to provide more insights into the, uh, the insights into the experimental results that we are seeing. Uh, next slide. So uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to run the experiment in the constant volume combustion chamber that's capable of generating a high pressure and temperature, high pressure and high temperature conditions, uh, that's, uh, and with good optical access, just to allow us to look into the detailed diagnostics. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the operation of constant volume combustion chamber, essentially what we do is that we inject a premixture that comprises of acetylene, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen into the chamber 
whereby we subsequently ignite it. Uh, once upon ignition, the pressure will quickly rise before it starts cooling down again due to the loss of heat to the surrounding. And once it reaches the temperature, uh, the temperature and condition that we targeted, we'll subsequently trigger the injection of fuel into the chamber. And, and using this uh, constant volume combustion chamber, we'll therefore investigate the hydrogen diesel direct injection processes. Uh, we, I shall be referring it to H2DDI from this slide onwards uh, using the following scheme, whereby we inject the pilot fuel before the main fuel, and then we subsequently investigate another injection scheme whereby we inject the main fuel before the pilot fuel. I shall talk about this more in the next couple of slides. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the type of diagnostics tools that we perform. Essentially, we monitor the pressure change that's associated with the combustion event itself. And based upon that, we subsequently derive the apparent heat release rate. In addition to that, we also perform a Schillerian imaging, which is a line of sight diagnostic that's extremely sensitive to the uh, presence of refractive index uh, in the measurement volume. So for example, in the Schillerian recording that you're seeing on the bottom right, you'll see that the combustion event lead to the production of hot temperature, high temperature combustion gases with lower density than that of the surrounding. This, this leads to the presence of a refractive index gradient, which subsequently translate to the darker region that you see on the image plane has above. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for the configuration, um, the ambient gas and injection conditions, we're running it at 21%, 52 by 890 Kelvin. So one thing to note that this ambient temperature is slightly above, uh, higher than the auto ignition temperature of the hydrogen. Uh, but the hydrogen at this temperature has a very long ignition delay. So any combustion event that you see can be attributed to the N-heptane. Uh, for this particular uh, experiment, uh, the, we have manipulated the injection properties in such a way that a majority of the energy actually comes from the combustion of the hydrogen itself, uh, whereas the diesel actually serves as a pilot, pilot fuel. However, one thing to note is that in the actual application, there's no reason why we can't increase the energy proportion that's coming from the diesel itself. Uh, this will give the engine a lot more fuel flexibility uh, to, uh, to change its engine operation mode depending on the fuel supply status. In addition to that, we also select to use a converging configuration whereby the hydrogen is actually uh, installed in the center of the port uh, at the axis that's parallel to the chamber side. The diesel will be injected at an angle with respect to uh, install at 12.3 millimeter from the hydrogen injector and an and angle of 12 degree from the injector axis. This converging setup has been shown in other dual fuel studies to provide the most stable uh, performance in terms of both ignition and combustion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm just going to run through quickly because of the short of time. But in, in essence, uh, we are investigating pilot main injection, whereby the pilot fuel is actually injected before the main. And we subsequently inject the main after before the pilot. Uh, in, for all this investigation, we'll be in, uh, varying the dwell time, which is basically the start of inject, the difference in the start of injection timing between the fuels. Either the, um, so we progressively increase them and see how it affects the combustion behavior. In addition to that, we will always compare. It, we will always we will also compare it with the reference cases whereby both fields are injected and in, in a near simultaneous matter. Now, for ease of referencing, we'll be adopting this, the following naming convention, whereby the first and third letters refers to the field that in, gets injected first and secondly, uh, whereas the numerical value in between refers to the dwell time that was used for the investigation. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a Schillerian recording of the uh, combustion phenomena that occur in the chamber. For this case, we're looking at a reference case whereby both the diesel as well as the hydrogen are injected simultaneously in the chamber. So what you notice from this particular recording is that the N-heptane will auto ignite first and upon interacting with the main hydrogen jet, which is uh, injected along the center uh, injector axis, what you notice is that the combustion front will quickly propagate to both the jet head as well as both all the way back into towards the injector itself. Now, the, the recession of the combustion back towards the injector is something that is unexpected, and that's typically something that's not observed in the diesel spray jet, uh, especially during the injection period against the very high jet velocity. So we are still looking in, uh, into the underlying mechanism for this specific um, phenomena. 
but this is certainly this will certainly have some significant heat transfer as well as emission implications uh, when it comes to actual implementation. Uh, next slide, please. So what you see here is the Shilirin uh, recordings. They are recorded for a series of pilot main injection strategy. Uh, and the figures on the right are basically the AHRR profiles that are collected for a series of pilot main injection strategies, uh, which are plotted as a function of time after the start of injection for the pilot field, or this time after the start of injection for the main field. Uh, just to put everything br uh, in a brief perspective, what we notice is that at a very short dwell time, uh, what would happen is that the n will, will be in the process of auto-igniting when it's actually interacting with the main uh, main hydrogen jet. At a later timing, the, the N-heptane will have auto-ignited and completed its combustion, uh, upon after, and then only the hydrogen will be injected into the chamber to interact with the uh, burn, uh, the burn product of the N-heptane jet itself. Uh, because of this uh, longer delay, it leads to a cool down in the combustion product, and therefore, the main hydrogen jet will actually experience uh, a greater degree of interaction and therefore mixing timing before it can undergo an ignition. This leads to the differences in terms of the AHR profiles, as you've seen in the figure above, whereby a longer delay would result in a higher AHR peak and also a corresponding drop in terms of the missing combustion phase. Uh, next slide, please. So in the others, in the other sense, uh, if you were to do, perform a main pilot injection strategy, so in all this, uh, just a quick note, so the red line there basically refers to the n heptane jet, the blue line refers to the hydrogen main jet, and the green line basically refers to the ignition, ignition uh, kernel. And the time that you see on the bottom left refers to the start of injection with reference to the pilot, uh, pilot injection. And the red boundary along the frame refers to the timing when the significant uh, AHRR uh, rise occur. So in, in the case of main pilot injection, uh, what essentially happened is that there's a longer period of time for the hydrogen to develop before it, it starts interacting with the uh, auto-igniting and heptane. And so this resulted in the greater AHR peak that you're seeing in the profile, as well as the corresponding decrease in the diffusion combustion phase. However, what you also notice is that if you were to increase the delay time before the, be, between the hydrogen and the diesel to such a degree, uh, what will essentially happen is that if the interaction were to occur after the end of injection, the propagation of the combustion front throughout the jet volume would not be uh, completed. Uh, this will result in the really unstable AHRR profile that you're seeing on the right-hand side of the figure. So, uh, and this is uh, attributed to the occurrences of overmixing. Uh, next slide, please. So, in, this is a summary of uh, what I've just presented. Uh, essentially, for pilot main injection, the combustion is caused by the interaction between the combustion product of the N-heptane and the unburned hydrogen jet. Uh, delaying hydrogen jet basically allows the n heptane to auto ignite prior to main injection, and all this would affect the peak heat release rate as well as the diffusion combustion phase. Uh, when it comes to the main pilot injection, the combustion is caused by the interaction between the auto -ignite, the igniting n heptane and the well developed hydrogen jet. Uh, delaying the n heptane injection would allow the hydrogen to develop more prior to the interaction. And if you were to delay the n heptane injection in such a way that the interaction occurs after the main fuel injection, this can lead to combustion suppression. So that's the uh, next slide, please. So that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to acknowledge the funding agency, the project partners, my research colleague, and as well as my research team. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, thank you, Professor Sean. Uh, we'll move to the next presentation by Professor Andrew Dambekar. Good afternoon. Hello.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll start with my talk now. Mm. As you can see, I'm going to be talking about uh, metal combustions for energy applications. And uh, my talk is basically my way of describing what we have been thinking about uh, a certain topic, uh, what uh, ideas we have come up with, and what we would like to uh, do in the future, especially uh, in the context of metal fuel. And their okay. Okay. And uh, the aim, of course, of using the, uh, these metal fuels is for zero carbon energy source, right? as a zero carbon energy source. So, in my presentation, I've gone uh, slightly on the basic side. I have I'll be reading some of the data which was already presented yesterday by uh, so many other uh, speakers, but I think it helps the narrative. So I'm going to continue with that. Uh, so let's look at what energy is needed for. The simplest and most true answer probably is everything. We need energy to create our food, we need energy to create infrastructure, we need energy for healthcare, we need energy for making more energy. Okay. So. For everything, we need energy, and we want this energy to be cheap, non-stop, and we want it in a large quantity. And uh, this, in a way, is represented by a heat engine analog here, which you come across, which I, I came across while studying about energy, environment, and economics. Like in, like in the heat engine, we take in some amount of heat, we get some work, and then we reject some heat to the environment. Our society takes in material and energy resources, throws out material waste and energy waste, and our society grows through this practice. The point of the figure is that the both the growth and the waste is inevitable, and for getting the growth, we continue to need energy resources. Would we like them to be also sustainable and non-polluting? Maybe. But uh, so far, the trend has been that this requirement does not trump the first three requirements. Which, which brings us to our current status, where we are. Right? Primary energy, as it's defined, uh, the energy available in nature. The global energy consumption, primary energy consumption, was uh, in 2020, uh, was 557 exajoules. 557 into 10 raised to 18 joules. That's equivalent of completely converting 6,000 kilograms of matter into energy using E is equal to mc square. That's one and a half adult Asian elephants, right? A lot of energy. Compared to Indian consumption, which is 32 exajoules, only one tenth of an elephant, not so bad. But all of that energy is on a continuously increasing trend. This current graph here, it shows a roughly linear trend, but it's a small portion of a much uh, larger trend, which is exponentially, which shows exponentially increasing energy requirements. And this dip here is, of course, the Corona year. We expect the uh, trend to go up and not down. And although this this graph again gives a rough distribution of energy sources that we utilize, I have made another one which focuses just on India. Various forms of this graph have been presented yesterday, but again, for the sake of narrative, we can see that in 2020, 55% of our energy came from coal, 28% from oil, 7% natural gas. So about 90% of our energy came from non-renewable carbon generating uh, sources, right? fossil fuels. What does that lead to? It leads to the millions and millions of tons of CO2 emissions. So because we want to run the societal engine on the energy that is available and that will in inevitably lead to some waste, which is the CO2 here, which we do not want, what we need is energy source without any carbon involved, right? So one of the uh, or currently proposed alternatives are, of course, solar and wind energy. There is good side to it and there is a bad side to it also. Uh, I'll just jump into the projections here. This is some back of the envelope cal calculations that I've 
I've assumed that since 2000, the energy requirement of India is growing linearly. And the blue dots here, which show the energy generations by renewables, is going to grow exponentially. Both of them unlikely scenarios, but this is to favor the uh, renewable energy sources. Even with these very favorable projections, we see that we'll be able to surpass the energy requirement 20 years down the line. So this is where I think I'm highlighting one more time that we need fuels that do not have carbon. That's where metals come in. Metals have high energy density, volumetric energy density, and they are safe to produce, do not uh, have any CO2 emissions. They can be oxidized not only with air, but also water and steam. Their combustion products are solid, so they can be captured and recycled. What we can imagine is a burner like this, or a system like this, where metal particles are burned to create heat and then captured again. And this energy, this heat then can be used to either run a uh, ranking cycle, power cycle, or we can look at uh, uh, running a external heat engine, which will then use to uh, create electricity. And when we put this in a completely circular uh, uh, cycle, uh, we will arrive at a uh, system where renewable energy is used to create these metal fuels using electrolysis, and then metal fuels will be used uh, to create the heat energy and the electricity that we need otherwise. Of course, we could use directly the renewables, but they're not consistently available. That's where uh, metal fuels can also be used for storage of renewable en electricity, uh, renewable energy. And uh, through certain studies and applying certain criteria, we have arrived at, a, or people have arrived at candidate uh, metals, which include aluminum, iron, magnesium, silicon, boron, titanium, and zinc. Some of these metals already have applications as energetic materials, but as standalone carbonless fuels, I don't think they have been used that widely yet. So uh, they also, the combustion of these uh, substances also leads to many fundamentally interesting phenomena, depending on the temperature at which they burn compared to the temperature at which they melt. And then uh, the temperature at which their oxides melt also create another layer of uh, interesting physics which can still be explored and which needs to be explored. Because they burn with several oxidizers, uh, people have reported that they can be taken through different cycles to arrive at clean uh, zero carbon energy. So this diagram here basically showing if we use metal water reactions, which mode we can take, and if we use metal uh, air reaction, which mode you can take. So where are more efforts needed? First of all, the fundamental combustion characteristics of these fuels need to be understood. We need to understand how the overall heterogeneous uh, flame of these metal particles propagate. And we have to develop the efficient burners and corresponding power generating devices for uh, such a, a particular energy systems. And the overall system validation, if it's actually feasible, is it actually economical, needs to be studied. So uh, what we are proposing here is to follow three distinct paths towards this. One is individual particle combustion, where individual particles will be fed into a post-combustion zone, oxygen-rich post-combustion zone, and their combustion will be studied. Second would be creating a burner, where uh, we will feed the particles along the flow with different ways of igniting them and try to stabilize a diffusion flame jet-like flame uh, with these particles. And third stream of studies would be post-combustion studies, where the uh, capture and filtration of these particles will be looked at, and also how to recycle them. So the challenge in general in front of us is to secure the energy demand that we have and avoid uh, the damage to the environment as far as possible. And to do that, of course, we can reduce our consumption, but uh, more importantly, I think what we need to do is improve the energy systems that we already have. And one option potentially is using metal combustions for energy applications. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.
talking about two different problems that uh, i'm currently working on first is a uh, high fidelity numerical simulations like dns of practical scale knocking phenomena that is actually applicable to ic engines and then i'll briefly talk about some of the issues of acoustic instabilities in ammonia ammonia combustion which is like the hot topic currently for energy so the first one uh, is now a joint project between ruki and uh, Open university, but it is actually a continuation of something that I was doing there. So we have been talking about ice engines and that ice engines are not dead and we need to develop more efficient engines, right? So if you want to develop more efficient boosted engines, then one of the major challenges is not and it can cause several damage to uh, IC engine combustion. So the first thing is we need to understand this. So if we, uh, if you are increasing the uh, thermal efficiency, then we are also increasing pressure ratio, and so the in cylinder pressure and temperatures will be much higher, which will be uh, more prone to knocking. And if you look at the physics of knocking, the major sequences that are involved in knocking, then first, uh, first is we have a spark igniting flame, which will then propagate, and then it will compress the in gas. There will be cool flame ignition and then further auto ignition and detonation development. Now, all these sequence of events, they are occurring on a different length scale, different time scale. So, all of these are, uh, so the problem itself is very multi scale and multi physics. So, and uh, now we need to understand this in a, a complete way. So, how these processes interact with each other. So, the beginning of the understanding of combustion comes from understanding of knocking comes from the idea developed by Jeldovich in 1980s. And this was, in fact, the case that most people used this model until for the last 20, 30 years. And the idea is based on uh, the, the spontaneous propagation of a time front in a uh, reactivity gradient uh, within the machine. And depending on the reactivity gradient, various kind of modes can be obtained, which uh, and some of them can lead to knocking, knocking, knocking. And based on this initial idea, uh, Professor Kargatki and uh, the group at Leeds University, they have developed this uh, non-dimensional regime diagram. So some of the cases can lead to detonation and some of the cases can. Uh, so depending on the conditions, we can uh, have a detonation. And this uh, diagram can also be used by more sophisticated uh, simulations and they can be put in this diagram. Now, uh, but this does not explain the proper uh, sequence of events that actually happen in ICM. So for the, uh, in the last year, there, there, there has been a lot of effort to do DNS-like simulations for knocking in 1D. So here we start with ignition of a flame and then it propagates and then, then we have uh, auto ignition in the end gas that is generated uh, through the compression and the automation process uh, that occurs in the engines. And here, the idea is to like simulate all the scales, starting from ignition to the uh, propagation and, uh, uh, and the detonation development, and taking into account the details of the chemistry, all the chemical models that we have for the uh, 
to understand the chemistry interactions to generate block chains. And I am giving here two examples. Uh, one is from for a more simple mixture. Another is from uh, for more complicated NFT mixture. And uh, uh, it had been, the effort had been successful. And now we understand more about knocking based on these efforts in the last decade. And we can also see that uh, depending on the conditions, depending on the conditions, we can have different kind of modes of auto ignition. For example, at higher temperatures and higher pressures, which will be more applicable to resell of the modern engines where uh, boosted engines, we can have different auto ignition modes and different auto ignition uh, propagation. For example, here the yellow, uh, sorry, the orange one that you are seeing is a spark ignited front. And then there are two different auto ignition fronts. And then this 1D DNS can also capture the effects of NTC. NTC is negative temperature coefficient regions. And uh, we can see that it is basically a non monotonic kind of uh, phenomenon. So it very much uh, depends on the kind of uh, fuel and the kind of uh, pressure and temperature ranges that we're looking at. Now, uh, all these 1D uh, uh, Simulations cannot actually capture the flame shape transitions, and we know that in actual engines, the flame shapes will be uh, changing, and it can develop, it can change the pressure wave development in the cycle uh, in the engines. So we actually need to look at a multi-dimensional simulation. So in this decade, uh, this this year, we have started doing this 2D DNS kind of simulation. This is a very challenging simulation, in, uh, and it uh, requires a large amount of computational effort and, and time, but it can uh, really lead us to the final answers of uh, the mechanism of knock and how we can actually Now, the most beautiful part about this simulation is it is done at a laboratory scale. So the scale of the DNS is same as one of the experiments, and this is like eight centimeter uh, closed, closed uh, constant volume chamber, and this is the same uh, that's the, the DNS is also done in the same condition. And this is, I think, comparable to the real IC engines that we see. So the scales are really the same as the uh, actual IC engines. So what we can find here is that if we do like a 1D DNS and a 2D DNS, then we can actually predict the knock timings very well. So uh, using this 2D kind of DNS. So this is actually very much representative of what we'll actually observe in the engine. So using this uh, method, we can actually predict uh, auto emission and knocking in real engines. So this is uh, the overview of uh, what uh, of the various modes that we've observed uh, using our 2D DNS. And we can see that uh, overall it looks similar to 1D, where we can have the two different auto emission zones or different uh, or one auto emission zone in the end gas or somewhere just ahead of the flame, but it will uh, depend on uh, the initial, initial time. So now I will uh, explain slightly more detail about some of these modes. So here we capture uh, starting from the flame ignition to the auto ignition development. So at slightly lower, temp uh, so if the initial mixture temperature is say 1100 Kelvin, then we'll have a sim single auto ignition development in the end gas. But if you slightly increase the uh, temperature, then we have two different auto ignition zones. So the auto ignition development in the end gas is very much uh, dependent on the initial conditions of temperature and pressure. And uh, if we uh, again change uh, the initial temperature to slightly higher values, we can see that there is like a, a auto ignition zone just ahead of the end gas. So if you are looking at very highly boosted engines and we have high temperature and pressure, then auto ignition can develop anywhere. It depends on the pressure wave development in the chamber. And the, these modes of auto ignition also affect the maximum pressure in the chamber. So how much will be the pressure that will be generated after we have the knock? And uh, then we also see the effects at higher pressure, and higher pressures are more severe uh, conditions. And we can see that uh, the mode also changes with the higher pressure. For example, this is simulation at a 33 bar, and this is at a 3 bar. And we can see at 3 bar where we had two uh, auto ignition zones, 
we had uh, two of Tennyson Jones in the corners, just ahead of the flame front, here near the flame front. So a higher pressure also leads to very strong acoustic disturbances, and we can actually capture very uh, elaborate explanation uh, of the actual mechanism of smoking and using this. So going forward, we'll need to uh, analyze this and maybe uh, develop some simpler models to predict knocking. And in the next uh, part, I'll just briefly talk about some of the issues that we encountered in uh, ammonia company. And uh, now we are talking about carbon neutral fuels. Here also we have been talking about uh, using hydrogen in various ways. And one of the ways of using hydrogen is uh, making ammonia from it. So because ammonia can be very easily transported, it, it has higher energy per unit volume. So uh, many people are also looking at using ammonia as a energy carrier and using it as a, as a direct fuel in, uh, uh, in furnace or uh, gas turbine engineering. So in Japan, uh, they are developing uh, power generator of uh, gas, uh, gas turbine power generator using ammonia as a direct fuel. Now, when we use ammonia, the most, uh, the basic problem that we have is it has very low reactivity. So the burning velocity is very lower and uh, uh, relatedly we have also low, higher ignition temperatures, low chemical kinetics. So what we need to do is we need to explore many additives which can enhance the combustion performance. So for example, there have been trials to do oxygen enhancement. So in place of air, we have slightly more oxygen percentage. Uh, then adding natural gas, uh, say methane or hydrogen. So using this, we can uh, improve the performance of uh, uh, ammonia combustion. Now, uh, the one of the issues uh, that have not been, uh, that has not been addressed and uh, many, uh, because people are not looking into those kind of problems is when we, try to enhance the properties of ammonia, we tend to get across the acoustic instabilities. Now, if you are using a power generator in a, in a gas turbine combustor, then uh, acoustic instabilities are very common. So we have done lots of studies on using, a, a, on studying thermoacoustic instabilities in gas turbine combustors. So we have been doing very simple experiments uh, for hydrocarbon fuels in the last, I think, four or five years or so, and we have, been using a simple experiment in a combustion tube. We just have a combustion tube. We fill it with the combustible mixture and see the flame propagation and how the acoustic instability is developed in, the, in that. So if you use uh, ammonia, methane, and uh, slightly enriched oxygen and nitrogen mixture, then what you find is if we increase the ammonia concentration, then it leads to a stronger acoustic instabilities, which means that uh, Ammonia combustion, if we are trying to enhance it, adding some uh, additives like oxygen enhancement or methane, then even though the flame velocities will be similar, but it will be prone to uh, acoustic instability. So this is the one aspect that we need to uh, look into more in coming, coming time. So uh, we are actually studying this and this is kind of a work, a research in progress. So with this, I'll come to the end of my talk. I thank you all for listening and I'm happy to discuss. Yeah, so thank you all the panel members for giving wonderful talks. Now I request audience if they have any questions to the panel members. Uh, yeah, Dr. Paramvir Singh. Hello. Yeah. So I have one question regarding the unburnt, ammo unburnt ammonia emissions. Like for NOx, we are using SCR, and for particulate matter, we are using basically DPF. So, how we can tackle the problem of unburnt ammonia? Do we have anything like catalyst to reduce this? Or we in AdBlue, we are using ammonia to tackle the NOx emission. Can we use that unburnt ammonia to tackle the NOx emission? Or... So 
you are asking about emissions that will occur from ammonia combustion. Yeah, in ammonia combustion, so, we have only yeah, yeah, two so, problems. One is higher NOx, yeah. and second one is unburnt ammonia. So, like if, yeah, so if you look into uh, pressure, uh, we can find actually optimum conditions of equivalence ratio and temperatures, which can lead to lower NOx emissions. For example, if you are slightly burning slightly rich, for example, equivalence ratio around 1.1, then we have the least NOx emissions. So, and uh, it depends on the stability of the if you are looking at the large scale combustor, we also need to look at the stability map and uh, Okay, so uh, yeah, so there are optimum uh, conditions, so in which it can be minimized. But I'm not sure if people are looking at uh, employing catalysts to uh, remove ammon unburnt ammonia. But I'm sure that uh, this research is going on. So maybe yeah, later. actually, in in Adview we have ammonia, basically urea, uh, at of some percentage. So we can use that unburnt ammonia that will basically react with the NOx in the tailpipe with the catalyst or anything else, I don't know. But that may be done. I don't know if, if this type of work is going on. So that, is the point. that is my point. Yeah, uh, okay, so if, uh, on the industrial scale, I'm not sure people are employing that currently, but uh, yeah, if, if we don't want to have ammonia uh, liberated in that atmosphere, so. While doing experiments, we tend to uh, we need, uh, we employ a catalyst to actually uh, suck all the ammonia from the combustion products and then let it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Two different combustors having uh, the same pressure size rate, uh, like uh, different fuels or different designs and all. Is it possible that the combustion acoustic will be entirely different for them? Like the pressure size rate for both is same, but the combustion acoustic and the decibels will be different. I'm talking about the combustion noise and combustion acoustic. Can we predict simply studying the pressure size rate? Is it possible to study the noise and tell something about the noise, combustion noise? Uh, growth rate is one of the important things that we measure, but it will not uh, tell you everything. So we, we actually need to look at, sometimes in uh, large scale combustors, we measure at different locations even. If the, depending on the acoustics of the chamber, the pressure uh, wave uh, evolution will be different. Right, so even the modes will be different, and depending on also, uh, even the press pressure rise the uh, rate is similar. It, depending on the frequency or some, the final pressure will be slightly different. And it, sometimes it can go to a saturation. Right, we we'll have a. Uh, uh, a saturated cycle where we have uh, no, uh, the non-linearity in the pressure rise will finally stabilize it, but then we can also have shootout. For example, if in the case of uh, parametric instability that we see, we can have violent shootout and it can lead to very high pressures. So but it, uh, yeah, so it also depends on the time when you are looking at. So even the pressure rise rate can vary depending on the kind of uh, system that we have. Uh, Professor Sean Chen, would you like to also respond to this question? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? I think my question is uh, two different combustor. The two engines of different design. One is going into diffusion combustion, the uh, other is maybe premix combustion. The pressure size rate is same. So, how it will uh, affect the combustion acoustic, like noise and all? The like, pressure size rate is same, and uh, how will be the combustion acoustic? Um, 
generally, we don't, uh, we haven't really looked into the knocking. Uh, in generally, uh, when it comes to hydrogen combustion, uh, we would like to minimize the apparent heat release rate peak. Um, and uh, at a higher compression ratio, we also see a higher knock as well. So currently, we're still looking at the fundamental. We haven't really looked into the uh, really practical side of things. So uh, I guess that's, that's my question at this stage, uh, my answer at this stage. Yeah, thank you, Professor Sean Chen. Uh, any other question from the audience? Yeah, Professor Raja Banerjee. Uh, one question I have, uh, I, uh, uh, I mean, any of the panelists can uh, can comment on it. When we are burning either hydrogen or matter ammonia, we're generating a lot more water vapor. Um, and at that elevated temperatures, do, uh, are there any metallurgical issues that you feel or, or, or if there's any literature out there uh, because of the presence of water vapor at that high temperature in large quantities? Right, so the question is about water from hydrogen combustion. I, I guess I can answer that quickly. Um, so there are lots of literature that talks about the issue with um, hydrogen combustion, which leads to the generation of water. Um, we have tried the injection strategy that I've mentioned uh, in my studies in an actual practical engine. At the moment, we are not seeing any issues with the water vapor as of yet. Uh, but there are some studies in the literature that indicates that uh, the, the presence of significant, significant water vapor could potentially interfere with the engine operation. So, so I, I guess we haven't quite seen it yet, but there are literature studies that, that report on that. Yeah, I can add something here uh, with respect to gas turbines. Yeah, for, for gas turbines, uh, water vapor is generally is, is not a problem. And that's mainly because uh, the blades, uh, especially the high, high pressure turbine blades, are made of uh, nickel based super alloys and they are quite resistant to water. In fact, all the uh, engines that you would see, uh, water injection can be used, steam injection can be used uh, for an aircraft. I mean, it has to go through the certification process of uh, water ingestion and hail ingestion. And that is typically not a problem. Uh, however, uh, you are right when you talk about uh, steam turbines. Uh, where the water has to be de aerated uh, before uh, it can be used in the cycle, um, and uh, uh, but but in general, uh, I think I agree with uh, Sean that it is not such a big problem. Thank you, Professor Arvind Rao. Uh, any other question from the audience? Okay, if there are no more uh, questions. We will start our student presentation. We have uh, a total of nine presentations. So we will start with the first presentation. So the first presentation is uh, by Aishi Ashimba. So please uh, start the presentation in a minute. And uh, for other presentation, we have the video. And we will play the recording. Uh, presentation after this. What we have is a live presentation. Hello, am I audible? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi, I am myself, Aisha Sirvar from Engine Research Lab, IIT Kanpur. My topic is development of constant volume combustion chamber to study hello, to study laser ignited gasoline directed injection spray. Uh, the uh, main background is that the stratified operation is being researched extensively because of its advantages over homogeneous operations. The advantages include reduction in pumping and wallet losses and increasing volumetric efficiency. But 
the stratified mixture are prone to combustion instability and misfires. Uh, these are uh, due to the presence of liquid fuel phase near the spark plug. And uh, here, this is an emerging area. And so, the main uh, motivation is to study, is to develop a constant volume combustion chamber so that we can study the effects of laser ignition on stratified gasoline spray. Here is my methodology. This is my experimental setup. And uh, uh, this uh, is my experimental flowchart which consists of material selection, literature studies, spray experiments to determine the axis of sym symmetric injector orientation and the simulations of different combustion parts. Uh, these are the results and discussions. First of all, uh, me scattering imaging is, imaging is done from front view and side view so as to determine the axis of symmetry. Uh, as you can see, this is the symmetric axis, so we can compare the laser ignition and spark ignition at the exact same location. And uh, from the side view, this is unsymmetric. And uh, mean scattering imaging is used, and the spray characteristics, as you can see, as we can see, the penetration length and the cone angle are used to determine the dimensions of the optical window, so we can, so we can uh, uh, analyze the combustion. And also, after determining the uh, optical dimensions, structural analysis, analysis of combustion parts are done. And uh, these are the injector mount is in design. And uh, optical view, as you can see, we can here is the spark plug, and here is the laser ignition. So, uh, in the analysis, we have incorporated the bolting forces, uh, uh, bolting forces, the temperature effects, the internal chamber pressure. And uh, the, uh, these are the factors we have considered while designing the analysis. And this is the uh, stress analysis of cylindrical part. Here is the uh, part one is uh, considered. And uh, these are the factors of safety of three is kept al almost everywhere approximately. And uh, hence, to conclude, this study reports the development of constant volume combustion chamber. This provides the rationale behind the injector location injector orientation and the associated ignition techniques. Hence, the chamber can withstand pressure and temperature up to 60 bar and 373 Kelvin respectively. Thank you. Any question? One quick question from the That, uh, the chamber to 373 Kelvin. Uh, do you just take it to higher temperatures? Be able to? Uh, the chamber we have designed is actually it can reach the maximum up to 373. Uh, other modifications are to be done so as to incorporate the higher temperature change. What would you change? By Samia. What, sir? What would you change? Uh, the uh, the uh, dimensions of the cylindrical part of the chamber will have to change. It, uh, it is kept actually. For considering the weight measurements, it is kept actually 5 mm thickness, so we can change that to incorporate higher temperature in this. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. We will move with the health presentation. Hello all of you, my name is Anand Sankar Singh and I'm, and I'm going to present our presentation on the topic Chemical Kinetic Analysis of Premixed Ammonia, Methane, Oxygen, Nitrogen, H2O2 Mixture to evaluate the feasibility of air replacement with hydrogen peroxide. As we are aware that the majority of power sector is still dependent on, on the fossil fuel burning and this fossil fuel burning is a major source of carbon emissions. So to mitigate the challenges, we need to focus our attention towards the greener fuels such as ammonia and hydrogen. Um, uh, uh, in this slide, I am going to discuss about the motivation and challenges associated with the ammonia combustion. The motivation include ammonia combustion does not generate CO, CO2 and soot because it does not contain carbon in it. It also acts as a hydrogen carrier, it's a renewable fuel, it's a green fuel and it is uh, easy to store and also it has well established network for transportation and distribution and also it also includes ammonia has a similar power density compared to fossil fuels. 
The challenges of ammonia combustion include, include ammonia is very difficult to ignite due to its high water ignition temperature compared to gasoline and diesel. Ammonia flame temperature is lower than the hydrocarbon flame. Also, it possesses lower kinetics and narrow permeability limit and low, uh, low flame speed. The potential uh, uh, potential uh, NOx emission are much more higher uh, higher in ammonia combustion due to fuel bond nitrogen. Uh, as, as, as in the last slide, we discussed that the ammonia has a low flame speed, so its flame speed can be increased uh, by blending with a higher reactive fuel such as methane or uh, uh, hydrogen, or it, or, or, or it, its laminar flame speed can also be increased by oxygen enrichment and also with the H2O2 uh, addition. So in the in the first slide, uh, in the first slide, I'm uh, 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 this result has been taken from the my my previous paper. In, in this, I am shown that the, the pure ammonia air mixture, laminar flame velocity, uh, the peak is around 7 cm per second, while the, this, uh, this lower figure shows the uh, uh, flame speed uh, value for the oxygen enrichment, uh, and uh, this right, to, right figure uh, shows the laminar flame speed for the hydrogen enrichment for the uh, case of 0 to 60%, and the, this lower one shows the uh, ammonia methane, uh, ammonia methane flame velocity uh, uh, at different uh, H2O2, uh, uh, H2O2 enrich, uh, H2O2 replacement. As, as we can as we can see that the ammonia flame velocity uh, increases up to the up to the hydrocarbon flame velocity with increase in the hydrogen enrichment or it uh, with the air replacement with H2O2 also with the uh, also with also with the um, oxygen enrichment. So these uh, all these all these cases all these cases uh, the um, all these cases the one different thing is that in case of uh, uh, pure ammonia mixture or oxygen enriched ammonia mixture or hydrogen enriched ammonia mixture the peak flame speed is uh, around the equivalence ratio of 1.1 in all three cases but here in case of uh, uh, H2O2 enrichment it has been shown that the Peak, uh, the peak of the flame speed starts shifting towards the leaner condition. So, in case of in case of 50% H2O2 uh, addition, it has been shown that the uh, normal peak is around the equivalence ratio of uh, 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 1.0. But while the H2O2 enrichment increases from 50 to 100%, the peak starts shifting towards the fuel in condition of 0.6. So this uh, this is a very beneficial approach. So because it increases the flammability limit of the ammonia air mixture, uh, which is a, which is a very good thing because ammonia has the narrow flammability limit. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Devojit Sharma from a research scholar from School of Science and Engineering Department, IIT Kharagpur. I will be presenting on the topic XSG analysis on excess enthalpy combustion of LPG hydrogen mixtures in an ultra intense high intensity mesoscale combustor. So, the recent in uh, advancement in the portable and miniature micro and mesoscale. Uh, devices has created an exponential increase for the compact and durable consistent power supply. So in terms of design aspect, if we can uh, see that a small scale micro combustor using hydrocarbon fuel, lower energy can efficiency can uh, even produce six to seven times more energy density than conventional power sources like lithium ion batteries. So therefore, it is a potential source that can replace high scale battery in future scenario. And uh, the 
for this advancement uh, in terms of design methodology detailed exergy analysis is required to effectively analyze the combustor design uh, which can provide a high exergy analysis under wider operating ranges so for the present work a numerical investigation has been done on the exergy analysis of a excess enthalpy combustion for ultra high intensity meso combustor uh using hydrogen and rich lpg mixtures at 0 50 and 100% enrichment ratio under 0.2 kilowatt so this is the schematic of the combustor as shown in the figure uh, basically the design is like that an annular heat exchanger is provided around the combustion chamber and the heat exchanger consisting eight longitudinal fin and air at the room temperature enters the heat exchangers and absorbs the heat so uh, and it further enters the combustion chamber through the eight holes and the fuel is entered through the central tube so uh, the um, um, the exergy generation analysis is performed uh, to illustrate the roles of heat conduction mass diffusion and chemical reaction the design methodology of the combustor entropy generation and uh, exergy analysis are also been reported in the present study so for the simulation standard k epsilon model has been considered to account for the turbulent intensity and non premix calculation are been conducted using edc model uh, under chemical equilibrium state by considering a recently developed usc50 reduced mechanism chemical kinetic mechanism and this variation of temperature in the combustor as shown is shown in figure 2 this shows that the reaction zone is completely inside the combustor domain and the heat conduction is the major source of entropy destruction as it uh, and it increases with increase in hydrogen enrichment as shown in figure 3 and the reaction of hydrogen is faster in Hello everyone, I am Subrat Gornai, going to present the topic on effect of N2. Hello everyone, I am Subrat Gornai, going to present the topic on effect of N2, CO2 and H2 dilution and mild combustion of methane hydrogen flame with extremely low oxygen content. Now coming to the introduction and problem definition. So mild combustion is a novel technique which is aimed at improving thermal efficiency of the combustor and it decreases the major pollutant emission like NOx and CO. It works on the concept of exhaust gas recirculation technique. Now coming to the problem definition part, here in the present work we have adopted the experimental J tin hot copro burner by Dali et al for our numerical work. Now uh, if you see the figure 1, we have central fuel pipe which is surrounded by a hot copro oxidizer stream and the burner is mounted on a wind tunnel in order to avoid the atmospheric contact which you can see in figure 2 and the region below 100 mm in the axial direction is considered as mild combustion regime. Now coming to the numerical modeling, the outlet of the burner can be modeled in a 2D axisymmetric computational domain. So in the numerical work Z equal to 0 0.03 meter, we have carried out our numerical experiment. Now in table 1 is the operating condition in the Z in hot coplow burner. Here we have adopted four different cases of dilution technique. The variation was only made in hot co-flow oxidizer inlet, not in the fuel inlet. Fuel is comprising of the 70% methane and hydrogen, 30% hydrogen in mass species. And in the co-flow, uh, for all those cases, 
uh, we have maintained oxygen content of 3% fixed and in case 1 we have adopted uh, N2 dilution in case 2 we have ad adopted H2 dilution in case 3 we have adopted H2 and CO2 dilution and in case 4 we have ad adopted CO2 dilution uh, the temperature of fuel is 305 Kelvin co flow is 1300 Kelvin and shroud air is 300 Kelvin and table 3 is the different model considered in the present work and in figure 4 is the validation work where you can see that the numerical methodology is perfectly validated with the measurements coming to the results and discussion figure 5 6 and 7 is the radial profile of temperature co and no mass fraction at z equal to 0 0.03 meter if you see figure 5 you can observe that there is a little variation of peak peak temperature for all the four cases if you see figure 6 you can see that maximum co was observed for case 4 and minimum co was observed for case 2 uh, and if you see figure 7 you can observe that the maximum no was observed for case 1 whereas the minimum was observed for case 2 in fact uh, the steam dilution is the effective method to achieve mild combustion in terms of reducing the emission to ultra low level Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, any question from the audience or panel members? Yes, online panel members, if they have a question, please uh, unmute yourself. Sudarshan, I have a question if I can ask. Hi, um, I was just wondering which uh, solver did you use and why only you limited your uh, uh, Let's say the simulations at only 0 0.03 uh, meters or uh, around three, three centimeters from the exit. And did you also look at what happens to the combustion at other locations in the downstream direction? Uh, yes, sir. So I have used a finite volume solver, uh, ANSYS Fluent. And I have uh, actually in my numerical work, uh, axial direction below 100 mm is considered as a mild combustion regime. Because above 100 mm or above uh, 0 0.1 meter, the atmospheric oxygen uh, has an effect to the flame. That's why below 100 mm is considered as mild combustion regime. So in that below 100 mm, at uh, 30 mm, we are carrying out the simulation and, and we are seeing what is happening. My question was, did you also look at uh, other downstream locations uh, when you uh, go for example 70 mm, 80 mm and so on? Uh, so, because in the original experiment by Dali et al., they have conducted at 30 mm and 60 mm. So, in that present experiment, I have carried, uh, shown in 30 mm distance. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Subrat. We will go with the next presentation. Greetings everyone. Topic of this presentation is measurement of lamina burning velocities of ammonia methane hydrogen fuel mixture at elevated temperatures. But due to the rapid climate changes, uh, carbon free fuels are being investigated. As combustion of ammonia is carbon free, it can be considered as alternative carbon free fuel. And the reason why ammonia is not being used as fuel uh, until now because of its low reactivity, low lamina burning velocities and large ignition delays and the problems in flame stabilization. So to be able to use uh, ammonia as uh, fuel in practical combustors, uh, the combustion intensity of ammonia must be improved. So here uh, the objective is to measure the lamina burning velocity of ammonia hydrogen methane air mixtures at elevated temperatures to understand the combustion characteristics of ammonia based fuels. To do so, this is the experimental setup which is being used in present work. Here, uh, fuel is um, uh, fed to the uh, mixing chamber with the help of mass flow controllers, which are being controlled uh, with the help of a command module and a computer. So, premixed fuel is fed to the uh, divergent uh, section at the end of which there is an external heater uh, to uh, maintain the adiabatic conditions. Ignition is provided here. Uh, once the flame stabilizes inside the divergent section, uh, the temperatures are measured using thermocouple. Uh, 
and with the help of these temperatures, the laminar burning velocity is obtained. So these are the results uh, which have been obtained. And it was observed that as the temperature ratio increases, the laminar burning velocity also increases for different equivalence ratios. Also, uh, the laminar burning velocities uh, of present work was compared with the work done by Hahn and others, where they used uh, ammonia and hydrogen mixtures and ammonia and uh, methane mixtures. It was observed that laminar burning velocity uh, for uh, present work where uh, the mixture were, uh, used was uh, hydrogen, methane, and ammonia, uh, the laminar burning velocities were higher. Also, at uh, higher temperatures, the maximum laminar burning velocities were higher, where it can be seen that for 300 uh, Kelvin, and uh, the laminar burning velocities are lower as compared to the temperature 450 Kelvin. So it can be concluded that laminar burning velocity increases with increase in temperature ratio and also hydrogen uh, is an is an effective technique to enhance the laminar burning velocity of ammonia based fuels uh, and when multi component fuel mixtures are adopted instead of the binary fuel mixtures the laminar burning velocities are higher and because um, the, uh, the volumetric fractions of hydrogen and methane are lower in multi-component fuel, it leads to a safer and cleaner combustion. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, any questions from the audience or panel members? Hi. So in your experimental setup, I've shown a heater. Could you explain the rule of the heater? Yeah, Pragya, can you answer this question? What is the role of the heater in the experiment? Uh, uh. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so the role of uh, heater in this setup is to uh, create an adiabatic uh, environment so that we get a flame which is planar and there is no such heat losses which can be accounted for uh, lowering the laminar velocity or instability in the flame while calculating the burning velocity. We okay, need to a stationary flame. So. Okay, thank you. Okay. One quick, one more quick question. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Hello, my audio. Hello. Uh, I just wonder, you are placing a uh, physical, I mean, thermocouple light up things in the combustion reaction zone and we uh, are calculating the burning velocities. So when we are using some correlation to convert this laminar burning velocity to Kelvin case, uh, will it really affect because you are, I mean, placing some physical then scale inside the combustor. So is it uh, the Pragya, can you answer this question? Are you available? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so actually, the setup is not an enclosed combustion uh, combustion system. It's an open end system, and the flame uh, which we are calculating is uh, using mass conservation equation for the inlet uh, uh, gases, which are the premixed gases coming in, to the uh, unburned gases near the flame. So we uh, just turn off the flame, and after that, we measure it using the thermocouple. So there is as such uh, density changes just because of temperature. Okay, thank you. So we'll start with the next presentation. Hello, greetings to all. I am Nile Dorlikar from Department of Aerospace Engineering, IIT Bombay, presenting measurement of laminar burning velocity of a toluene air mixture at high temperatures by UP Padhi, myself and Professor Sudarshan Kumar. Introduction. 
एल वी इज अ वेरी वाइटल फिजियोकेमिकल प्रॉपर्टी ऑफ अ प्रीमिक्स फ्यूल ऑक्सीडाइजर मिक्सचर इट इज अ स्पीड ऑफ प्रोपेगेशन ऑफ वन डी लैमिनर एरोबेटिक फ्लेम विद रिस्पेक्ट टू अनबंट मिक्सचर एज अ टालो इन इज अ मेजर एरोमेटिक कंपाउंड इज अ पॉपुलर गैसोलिन फ्यूल इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट टू स्टडी द कम्बशन कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स ऑफ टॉलोइन The aim of this research is to determine the LVV of a toluene from temperature 300 to 650 Kelvin at atmospheric pressure for equivalence ratios between 0.7 and 1.5. Experimental setup. Here, externally heated diverging channel is used to determine the laminar burning velocity. Diverging channel is 15 cm long with inclination of 15 degree. The liquid toluene is regulated by pump, then mixed homogeneously with hot air. at temperature above the boiling point of a toluene to evaporate it then the premix gaseous mixture of toluene and air is passed to diverging channel following equation is used to calculate the laminar burning velocity experimental lbv is plotted at different equivalence ratios and compared with the several literature and also with the predictions of two kinetics models first ll and l by nakamura and others and second by metcalfe and others here kempkin is used for the computation most results are in a fair agreement for the temperature of 300 and 470 kelvin but at higher temperature of 540 kelvin both the kinetic models over predict the data in this analysis temperature of 300 kelvin is considered as a reference temperature and lbv versus temperature ratio is plotted at equivalence ratios from 0.7 to 1.5 out of which 0.9 and 1.4 are presented predictions of both the models are a close match with experimental data predictions as equivalence ratio of 0.9 are better than 1.4 the values of temperature exponent alpha are calculated by applying the non linear power law equation the table shows the alpha at different equivalence ratio and plot compare the values of alpha here results of both kinetic model show the over prediction conclusion the lbv are in a good agreement with the literature data and both the kinetic models at 300 and 470 kelvin but the improvement is needed in the kinetic models of aromatic fuels at a temperature higher than 500 kelvin thank you presenter is not available so we'll go ahead with the next hello everyone myself akshat jain presenting at the 6th international conference on sustainable energy and environmental challenges the topic is stability of nanofuel suspension and mitigation of particulate emissions from the combustion of liquid fuels particulate matter and or aerosols produced from various combustion sources like gas stoves chimneys firewood etc lead to severe air pollution automobiles is one of the major source the emissions produced from automobiles cause serious health effects as well as deteriorates the environment considering these issues bharat state emission norms the norms set up by the government of india to regulate the exhaust emissions from the tail pipe of engine has been updated from bs4 to bs6 the most important aspect of bs6 norms is the inclusion of particulate number limit in addition to particulate mass the emissions from automobile impact indoor air quality as well as global air quality to mitigate these emissions experimental studies will be carried out by improving the liquid fuel quality with the use of nano additive parallelly we will do the exhaust sampling to form the more stringent emission norms Baseline characteristics of the variable compression ratio engine and the optical access engine has been set up. The plot shows the variation of brake power, brake specific fuel consumption, and brake thermal efficiency with respect to load. The present data is for neat diesel, and the measurements for nano fuel will be done in future. Figure shows the variation of light intensity scattered with respect to particle size using dynamic light scattering. four different nano fuel sample has been prepared with the addition of aluminum oxide in neat diesel span it is the surfactant used all milling and bath sonicator have been used to break down the particles to smaller size and let these particles remain dispersed for long time 
from figure we can see that with the use of ball milling and bar sonicated together as for sample 4 there is a shift in every particle size distribution towards the left this shows the presence of smaller size particles even after a few days and as the stability of nanofill suspension Particulate matter, fine and ultrafine particles, oxides of nitrogen, soot, and other harmful gases produced as a result of combustion of liquid fossil fuels still remains a challenge today. The concept of blending nano additives to fuel is a promising way as it leads to the improvement in combustion, performance, and emission characteristics of the engine. Baseline characteristics of the variable compression ratio engine and optical engine has been set up. The stability of nanofuel suspension has been studied using dynamic light scattering. With the and with the addition of bar sonicator and ball milling. In the long run, we need to develop eco-friendly, economically sustainable, and stable nano additives for liquid fuel. Thank you. Uh, one quick question from audience or panel members. Uh, could you please characterize these nano additives? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so basically, right now I am using aluminium oxide. Okay, I have started my research uh, using the aluminium oxide nanoparticles. So we are planning to use uh, other nano additives also. So what is there? Uh, the nano additives uh, we have purchased uh, from a company, manufacturer company. So before the usage of uh, these nano additives in the liquid fuel. Uh, I am characterizing the particle size of uh, the particle size distribution of uh, these nano additives because if the size of these particles will be large like as we have seen so they will sediment faster and uh, the benefits of adding nano additives will be of nullified so we want that these nano additives should uh, be uh, less than 100 nanometer or of a smaller size so for that uh, we are using uh, two old solutions one is the ball milling which will help us to break the particles to smaller size. And the bath sonicator or probe sonicator will be used. So these will have the particles to remain dispersed for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll uh, Thank you, go ahead with the last presentation of our session. Uh, sorry, second last. Greetings everyone, my name is Anuj Kumar and my co-authors are Isan Sharma, Krishan Chetan Bharti and Dr. Santanuti. My topic is Numerical Investigation of Differential Diffusion in a Laminar Hydrogen Diffusion Flame. Nowadays, pollution is the major problem. To reduce this, we have to select pollution-free fuel. Hydrogen is one of the fuel which is pollutant-free. As hydrogen combustion eliminates harmful pollutants such as carbon monoxide and unburned hydrocarbon. As hydrogen is the lightest species compared to heavier species like oxygen and nitrogen, the main motivation behind this study is to understand the influence of differential diffusion in hydrogen laminar flame. A laminar non premix flame burner by Toro et al. Taken under consideration, consisting of central fuel jet, 9 mm diameter, surrounded by co-flowing air with 95 mm diameter. The fuel jet consists hydrogen and nitrogen in 1 is to 1 mole ratio, issued with 50 cm average velocity. And the co-flow air is issued with the fixed velocity of 50 cm per second. The temperature of both the stream is taken 300 Kelvin. Two different cases are studied with and without differential diffusion of chemical species. In both the cases, the governing equation for mass, momentum, energy, and species mass fraction are solved. Differential diffusion is approximated using Chapman and Stone formulation and the fixed law. For the case without differential diffusion, we take the Smith number is 0 
a different axial location, the increase in the center line temperature is observed, followed by a decrease in the mole fraction of hydrogen. The peak temperature compares quite well with the experimental data. However, the lean side of the flame is wider than the experimental data. If we look at the center line plot, the temperature and the species mole fraction are well captured with the experimental data. If the differential diffusion effects are taken into account, apart from some over prediction of hydrogen and some under prediction of nitrogen mole fraction, with the case without differential diffusion, the temperature and the species are not well captured with the experimental data. The comparison of numerical results of temperature and species mole fraction yields very good agreement with the experimental data at all locations when differential diffusion is considered. Without differential diffusion, the predicted temperature is good at most locations except the center line. However, there is a significant over prediction of hydrogen mole fraction. When the differential diffusion is considered, hydrogen diffuses faster from the center line because the diffusivity of hydrogen is very high as compared to other species. The effects of thermal diffusion and the thermal radiation needs to be explored. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, any quick questions from the audience or the panel members? Sudarshan, I can ask you one. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, uh, I think probably uh, the speaker has used uh, open form, and which reaction model has been used to characterize the flame? Yes, sir. I am using a uh, reacting form solver in open form. And uh, the reaction mechanism, I used the Muller's reaction mechanism. And for uh, different, uh, different, uh, differential diffusion, I use the uh, Chap uh, Chapman and Soho model for binary diffusion coefficient and uh, the fixed transport equation for uh, differential diffusion. And did you also model radiation or not? Uh, sir, uh, no, uh, not yet. And, and you, were, you were trying to solve the Sanders case, or which, which case did you try to solve? Uh, sir, I'm uh, trying to uh, solve the uh, Toro et al. case, uh, the experimented data. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. thank you, Professor Rao. We go ahead with the last presentation of our session. Greetings everyone, my name is Ishan Sharma and today I will be presenting my work on the topic Large Eddy Simulation of Lifted Methane Flames in a Vitiated Co-Flow. The motivation behind studying lifted flames is their numerous applications such as in gas turbine, diesel engines and boilers to name a few. In commercial boilers, flames are made to lift deliberately to reduce nozzle damage by minimizing contact between flame and the nozzle. Fundamentally, lifted flames are of interest as although these are simple systems, they exhibit important characteristics of finite rate chemistry, turbulence chemistry interactions, local extinction, and other effects. Their stabilization is a delicate balance between chemical kinetics and turbulent transport at the flame base. Prediction of flame stabilization in these flames is a challenge for numerical combustion codes. Hence, there is a need for developing numerical tools capable of predicting such flames to help the combustion engineers in designing efficient combustors. Here on your right, you may see the difference between a lifted and a burner stabilized flame. The simulated flame configuration is the vitiated co-flow burner of UC Berkeley. It consists of a central turbulent jet of methane air issuing into a co-flow of combustion products generated from multiple lean premix flamelets. The diameter of the jet is 4.57 millimeter and the remaining boundary conditions are provided on this table on the right. Sensitivity of flame lift of height to the co-flow temperature is performed for these three temperatures where 1350 Kelvin is the base case. So we use the multiple mapping conditioning approach to simulate these flames. 
Multiple pipeline conditioning or MMC LES is a hybrid model where filtered or layering equations are solved for mass, momentum, and mixture fraction, while the composition is evolved on stochastic Lagrangian particles. A sparse resolution of one stochastic particle per 10 Eulerian cells is used, making this approach computationally efficient. An animation of the simulated flames is shown here. The left half presents the velocity field evolved on the finite volume cells, while the right hand side presents the temperature solved on stochastic particles. The flame liftoff is clearly visible from these temperature contours. For a quantitative comparison with the measurements presented on the right are the axial profiles of composition scalars such as mixture fraction, temperature, and species mass fractions. A, to a good agreement with the experiments is observed. The radial profiles of the temporal moments of the temperature field are presented on the left. MMC LES is able to capture the peak temperatures in the shear layer near the flame base at Z by D40 reasonably well. The RMS temperatures are somewhat overpredicted near the jet exit till Z by D30, possibly due to insufficient molecular mixing. The variation in the liftoff height with the co-flow temperature is shown on the right. A linearly decreasing trend is observed with increasing co-flow temperatures. In this work, multiple mapping conditioning approach is successfully applied to simulate a series of lifted flames stabilized above a hot vitiated co-flow. A sparse resolution of stochastic particles is used to achieve the numerical solution. With an increase in co-flow temperature, a linear decrease in lift of height is observed. Further, chemical explosive mode analysis or SEMA may be performed to gain insight into the stabilization mechanism of these series. Thank you for your attention. The authors would like to acknowledge the HPC facility at IIT Kanpur for providing the computing resource for this work. Okay, thank you. So, our uh, presenter is not available online. So, with this, uh, we close this session. We are very thankful to our uh, panel members, both online as well as offline. Uh, let me give a formal thanks to Professor Anai Kim for joining from uh, Korea, uh, Professor Arvind Rao who joined from Delft University, Netherlands, and uh, Professor Sean Chan, thank you very much for joining from Australia. Thank you. And also thanks to Professor Anirudh Becker and uh, Professor Ajit Kumar Dubey. So I'm handing over to our uh, organizers. Thank you, sir. So I'd like to thank all the panelists and the moderator of this session and those who have joined this session virtually. So I'd like to thank all of them. Now it's time to honor our panelists and the moderator of this session. So first, I would like to invite Professor Abhinas Kumar Agrawal to honor the panelists and moderators. So the first panelist is Dr. Ajit Kumar Dube. Thank you. Dr. Anirudh Kambikar. And the moderator of this session, Professor Sudarshan Kumar. Thank you, uh, dear colleagues uh, who are present online. I really appreciate your contributions. The society would like to honor you next time when we hold the conference and when you are physically present here. 
we really appreciate your time and effort and your sharing of knowledge and contributions to this session. And uh, I would like to place on record my sincere appreciation to all of you on behalf of the society. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so now we have the tea break and we will meet again at 4 p.m. for